Miigwech to Roberta and um, to the whole team at the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health. It's a huge honor to be here and to be able to speak to all of you. So uh, thank you to all of you who have joined today. So today, my focus is going to be on really how we can look at improving overall the experiences of our peoples in the healthcare system. Prior to doing that, I wanted to acknowledge the many people who've contributed to the work. Specifically for this presentation, I wanted to acknowledge the beautiful graphics, which have been done by Chief Ladybird and Selena Mills, and we're using those with permission of Women's College and United Way's Local Love. Some of the work that I'm presenting here, I've done in collaboration with uh, my amazing Anishinaabekwe colleague, Dr. Marsha Anderson, and also with two colleagues who are allies, Drs. Allison Cooper and Ayelet Cooper, so acknowledging them. And when we speak about some of the wise practices and changes that we can make within our institutions, I'm drawing on work that has been done with the Indigenous Health Steering Committee of an organization called Healthcare Can, and that work was funded through support of the McConnell Foundation. Of course, before moving on to any other acknowledgement, I wanted to recognize that I'm sitting here in Toronto on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Huron, Wendat, Anishinaabe people, and specifically, and now the, and historically, the home of Mississauga of uh, Credit, and recognize that here in Toronto, we welcome people from across Turtle Island, and there are many peoples from across the globe who are here. So it's always an honor to be thinking about that, our ancestors who walked in this territory, and for you to also be thinking about in your specific locations, the traditional people's location where you are. Thank you to Roberta for the introduction, and I always joke that that's my uh, Western bio that I need to share for a lot of the work that I do in the academic context, but that, of course, doesn't really fit with thinking about how we would introduce ourselves in our own way as Indigenous peoples. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about who I am and where I've come from. My education in the Western world is an internal medicine specialist. But my background is as a mixed blood in Anishinaabe Kwe. My mom is from a community called Shebanoning, also known as Killarney, and we are located in northeastern Ontario. And given that background and my clear attachment to my history and the history of our peoples and our community, my goal in coming into medicine was always to think about how we could make our institutions, our healthcare institutions, safer places for Indigenous peoples overall in order to achieve health equity so that every time a First Nations Inuit or Métis person comes into any contact with a healthcare provider, we know that they are having their true identity and indigeneity valued as well as receiving the highest quality healthcare. So that introduction, as you know, we often don't get a chance to introduce ourselves and who we've come from, where we've come from and who our peoples are, whether we're of settler descent or Indigenous descent or mixed as I am. And that becomes an important part of thinking about how we change our institutions in order to make them accessible places. And I call that self-location. And self-location, we know, is a really important component of cultural safety, which we're going to be talking about in a little more detail here. So I want always, when I do this kind of work, and I urge those of us who are working in both, you know, Western and Indigenous organizations to think about self-location. But self-location is not just who I am and where I've come from and who my ancestors and people are and, and land base are. It's also moving on to the next component, which is reflexivity. And reflexivity is about thinking not only the piece around who I am, but what biases and privileges do I carry with me? And really important as a healthcare provider that we're considering that because we know that we are not growing up in a vacuum, that we are heavily influenced by our families and communities and also the larger society around us. And we often, even as Indigenous peoples, may take on biases. And some of those biases may, in fact, be unexpected ones. So it's important to think about what those biases are and all of your different social identities. We call that intersectionality or, you know, sexuality and gender identity and socioeconomic status and ability and many other factors around social identities and think about how those influence the perspectives that we bring to any of the work that we do. So 
Now that I've done the introduction, I'm going to speak a little bit about the rest of the topics that I'd like to cover. And Roberta went through some of the learning objectives. And and the first learning objective around accessibility and availability and access really will be running throughout the talk. I'll be referring to examples. What I'm not here to do today is to share data around access. I think we are familiar, many of us, with the data around healthcare outcomes for our peoples. I will speak a little bit about some specific examples, but my main focus is going to be on how we can work towards better institutions for our peoples. And to do that, I'm going to talk about both some foundational frameworks for every time, any time I'm teaching in this realm, but also key concepts that you probably many of you are familiar with, cultural safety, allyship, trauma-informed care, and anti-racist and anti-colonial practice. And to spend the last component thinking about some specific things that our institutions can do in order to welcome our people. So I realize that many of the folks in this webinar are familiar with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but I find even as an Indigenous practitioner, it's nice to go back to these and remember that our rights are protected both at the national level, but also by this UN declaration. And it's a nice reminder of what I think are important principles for us to consider in all of our practices and our work in healthcare, that we have the right to be self-determining, the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for exercising the right to development, specifically including the development of health programs, that we have the right to traditional medicines and health practices and access to all health services, and that we have equal right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. And for those who may be doing this work in your organization, I find that that can be a helpful tool in terms of educating other people who may not be as familiar with this sort of work as a reminder that we're not operating really independently, but we have this larger goal in mind that's been recognized and supported by Indigenous peoples and our brothers and sisters across the globe. To present the next framework will be also one that you're familiar with, and that is the principles of the TRC. And again, another slide that I like to remind people about when I'm doing this work that reconciliation requires constructive action on addressing the ongoing legacies of colonialism. So that really, in the work that we're doing, we need to be focusing on meaningful action is something that I think is important because there's a tendency to do a lot of data gathering, a lot of engagement. But sometimes when we get into the translation and implementation, we are not necessarily moving in that way as much as we should be that we are really the goal of reconciliation is to create a more equitable, inclusive society. And that means closing the gaps in social health and economic outcomes. And that's a reminder to me that as for all people, health and well-being is much more than just physical health and actually access to the healthcare system. It's about the social circumstances in which we live, our economic situation, employment status, all of the things that we call the social determinants of health that the National Collaborating Center, of course, speaks really frequently about, and there's a lot of data around this on their website. Another point around TRC that's nice to remind folks of is that we are all treaty peoples, so that no matter who you are, what your background is, if you're a settler who's new to Canada, or if your ancestors came here 500 years ago, that you have a commitment to be involved in reconciliation work. And that reconciliation is a process of healing and that we need to do public truth sharing. So I think we do do a lot of public truth sharing and we're in this environment right now where I feel like there's a lot of antagonism and anger often around that truth sharing and that we need to also remember that a part of the truth sharing is to work towards healing for our peoples, but also healing those relationships. And so when we have the focus on truth sharing for healing, I think it helps us focus our energy in a good way on what our goal is. And this upcoming slide is courtesy of my friend, Marsha. And again, a lot of what I'm sharing here are tools that you may wish to share in your own organizations or in your practices. And I really do like to remind everyone that reconciliation work and the healing work that's required and that's the act of sharing truths and the act of talking about 
accessibility for our peoples or a lack of accessibility in many instances and availability can be very uncomfortable. And when we speak about race in a way that can threaten a person's sense of identity or in a way that disrupts the usual social relationships, as we need to do when we speak about the effects of colonization, that's uncomfortable for people. And we need to become comfortable with discomfort. And I like to juxtapose that, as Marcia does here, with what's unsafe. And clearly, these conversations that we're having are not unsafe. But what is unsafe are all the experiences these peoples have had in residential school, through starvation, through medical experimentation, mass child apprehension, discrimination, deliberate smallpox, etc. So just to make that distinction that although these conversations can be difficult, and I've seen really them be quite emotional for folks, especially when we're disrupting the usual power dynamics, that that's expected and that's okay. And actually transformative learning, which is what we need to start to work towards health equity for our people, is uncomfortable often. And through that discomfort comes great learning. The next slide is about a common concept, and there are many different definitions of cultural safety. And this is one that was initially adapted at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, where I do a lot of work around accreditation or curriculum in Indigenous health. And this is a reminder that healthcare practitioners must take into consideration the social, political, linguistic, economic, and spiritual realms in which our patients live in order to communicate well with them. I like this introduction to cultural safety because it reminds one that cultural safety is actually a concept that can be really optimize the care for all peoples. Specifically, when we're thinking about Indigenous peoples, of course, we need to think about the history and ongoing effects of colonization. And Dr. Iria Petty Ramsden, who is a Maori nurse scientist who first described the concept of cultural safety described it because she noticed that her own peoples were having negative experiences in the healthcare system and wanted to understand why. But now what we're seeing is that cultural safety is being taken up as a really useful framework for thinking about the care of everyone, and in particularly the care of people who are structurally marginalized. By the way, that beautiful image by Selena Mills is of the tobacco plant. So many of the graphics that you'll see in here are of our traditional medicines. Uh, cedar and sage and tobacco and some of our friends in the animal world as well. So just a few reminders about cultural safety, and that is that cultural safety is an outcome. And one of the key points about cultural safety that I like to remind people is that it is different from the earlier teachings around cultural sensitivity and cultural competence in that it is an outcome defined and experienced by the people who receive the care. So it takes the power in a model of competency or sensitivity when focusing all of their energy on developing a competent provider and they have the knowledge and skills. Whereas with cultural safety, we're really shifting the power and saying, no, it is the patient or a client who determines whether it's been a good experience. And I think that's really important when we're thinking about access and availability for our peoples, because you may feel like you're a really great provider and that you're you're doing a, a great job with your indigenous clients and that they are, you know, you seem to have a great rapport. And then you may ask them or ask a family member about the experience of care or someone else may ask them. And they would honestly say, you know what, that felt completely dehumanizing or I did not feel respected or good at all. So I think shifting the power to thinking about the patient being able to determine and describe whether it's been a good experience and allowing them to guide us is really important. My friend, uh, Dr. Suzanne Stewart, who's a researcher here in Toronto, <laughs> says to me, Lisa, isn't cultural safety just really simple? Isn't it really about being respectful and respectful engagement that helps the patient along their journey of well-being? And of course, this is at the heart of cultural safety. But unfortunately, many of our people still do not experience respectful engagement within the healthcare system. So there are lots of different examples around access being different for Indigenous peoples. And as the Health Council of Canada report describes, that responsibility often lies solely in the lap of healthcare providers themselves. And they did lots of interviews with 
Indigenous community members across the country. And what was frequently described to them were experiences of racism and bias. We have that data that's been also represented in numerous other studies. Dr. Janet Smiley in our health calendar her recent work is demonstrating the same thing around urban, urban Indigenous peoples' experiences in Ontario. And First Peoples Second Class Treatment, another report by Dr. Smiley and Billy, who is showing the same thing around access. And then we have lots of specific examples, like the fact that in Northwestern Ontario, if you're an Indigenous person who comes into the hospital and has a heart attack and a non-ST elevation or an ST elevation MI, and you meet the criteria for angiogram, you're less likely to be referred than if you're a non-Indigenous person. Or the First Nations Health Atlas report that's showing significant growing gaps, actually, in premature mortality, the difference between First Nations people in Manitoba and non-First Nations people. So what we're seeing is that the access is an issue and that the gap continues to grow. And thinking about cultural safety as one of the structural factors that we need to address. So how do we make our institutions safe? Our next slide is about really getting at a reminder that cultural safety involves looking at power. And I mentioned that some of the larger institutional factors, I think it's important that we start to think about cultural safety, not only in the provider-client or provider-patient interaction, but at the larger level around the institution. So understanding the power dynamic that exists between a patient and provider that's you know, significantly enhanced for someone who has been excluded from the healthcare system for many reasons through colonial processes like institutionalization, over-incarceration, residential school experiences, but that we also start to think about the fact that our institutions have not made an effort to value and support the well-being of Indigenous peoples. And what Do we need to do at the institutional level to make those changes? And stay tuned because I'm going to be discussing that towards the end. So, again, modeling that idea around self-location and thinking about your biases and reflexivity, as I did at the beginning, although I didn't, of course, do a whole list of what my inherent biases are and how I'm working to mitigate those, but that's what one should do. Cultural safety really involves remembering that you need to locate yourself, and acknowledge that we all are bearers of culture. So one of the things that we notice in the dominant medical culture and healthcare overall is that we are expected as providers to be objective. And I think when we consider objectivity as being fair, that's an amazing goal. But the reality is that we are not objective. We have our own backgrounds, beliefs, assumptions, and values that impact the care that we provide. And so a lot of the work that we're doing now in medical education is saying, hey, let's understand where we've come from, not just as an individual provider and your own, you know, own specific cultural and other backgrounds, but really the institution itself and say, no, this is not an institution that has no culture. Each of our institutions has a culture, and that often is one which has been exclusive for our people. So last slide on cultural safety is, once again, just a reminder that we need to understand these power differentials and that we need to fix these changes structurally, not just individually. The next concept that I want to talk to you about around thinking about access and then this is on the next slide, is that of allyship. And one of my first patients colleagues says to me, well, why are you thinking about allyship? But the reality is that even as a Anishinaabekwe physician, there are many opportunities for me to be allies. I'm a, you know, a cisgendered woman. As a physician, I am in a high socioeconomic status. I am a physician, and we know that there remain certain hierarchies within biomedicine, and we're not including other healthcare providers. So there are many opportunities for me to be an ally, and I do like to speak about allyship. Here's one way to think about allyship. It's someone who's not in the group experiencing discrimination. An ally supports the rights of marginalized people and acts when people face discrimination. And I always like to say, rather than marginalized people, I like to use the phrase structurally marginalized because it's a reminder that people in our society are marginalized by systems and structures. 
and that they should not be carrying that burden themselves. In medicine, a person needing an ally could be a patient, a family, caregiver, a colleague, a hospital employee. And again, depending on the situation, we can be an ally or we may need an ally ourselves. So this idea that allyship in some situations, you may be able to actually step up and be an ally. Even in another situation, you may feel like you don't have power and you're not able to be an ally. So again, we're getting back to this idea of relationships and relationality, which is central to many of our nation's ways of thinking about the world and about knowledge. And allyship is imbued with the notion of cultivating, building, and strengthening relationships. And it's based on a respectful, meaningful, and beneficial interactions. And that's a definition by Ashley Hooslip. I'm going to move on to another key concept for thinking about access to care for our peoples. And this is the concept of trauma-informed care. And trauma-informed care, when I teach about this with our learners and others, I remind them that trauma-informed care is a universal precaution. It's like hand-washing. So when we go in to meet a patient, whether it be in a clinic or a community or a hospital room or in their home as a provider in their home, we do hand-washing because we know that helps with their overall quality of care and exposure to bacteria, et cetera. Trauma-informed care should be the same thing. It should be a universal precaution. And the idea of trauma-informed care is that it increases the safety of care we provide within healthcare settings by considering the possibility that each individual we engage with may have a history of trauma. So this does not mean that we specifically isolate certain groups of people as being more likely to have experienced trauma. That's that's not actually a culturally safe way to practice because you're making assumptions about individual patients. It actually is a practice where we assume that every single person whom we encounter may have experienced trauma, and we need to consider that in the way we're caring for them. And what does that mean? That means in concrete ways, and the most specific and clear example that I give is when someone's experienced any kind of physical or sexual violence, What do we do when they often are experiencing care in a hospital setting? And I'll speak about that because that's the context in which I work. We have them lying in a hospital bed in clothing that's not their own. They may not be properly draped. They may have a team of healthcare providers surround them, standing up while they're lying down, and then go to examine them in their most private areas, for example, placing your hand on someone's chest to feel the point of maximal impulse of the heart, which is the standard component of the physical exam. Or even another good example would be standing behind a patient and placing your hands in front of them and around the thyroid gland and having them swallow and palpating their thyroid gland, which involves having your hands right around their neck. You can imagine that that is a traumatic experience for many people. But if one's experienced violation of your physical space, in the past or violence, that can be incredibly triggering. So rather than assuming that, oh, this person's likely to have experienced trauma or this person is not, we practice trauma-informed care with everyone. So for me, that means, hello, so-and-so, you know, whoever, introducing myself, identifying what my role is so that we help to clarify what our working relationship will be and what my specific role is which helps give a person power in the provider-patient relationship, but also alerting them to what I'm going to do. So I'd like to examine you now. Is that okay? I'm going to be listening to your heart now. I'll be placing my hand here. When one starts this kind of practice, it becomes really automatic and routine, and patients are very grateful for it. So we're at this stage now where many of our institutions are saying this is a key way to practice in a trauma-informed way. And just a few more principles around trauma-informed providers, because trauma-informed care is not just about the provider, but it's the organization. So if trauma-informed providers and organizations acknowledge the widespread impacts of trauma, recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients and staff and other providers, and that might mean, for example, when someone's having a really strong response that one may think is 
little bit different than one expects, strong emotional response or a strong spiritual response or some way in which they're behaving that think, oh, this does not seem quite what I expect, that we're not pathologizing that, but we're thinking, okay, well, I need to do a better job of practicing in this trauma-informed way, that we recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, as I said, that we understand that people can manage trauma in very different ways, like anger, avoidance, substance use, and that everyone has a different pathway to healing. And we need to integrate this knowledge about trauma into our policies, procedures, practices, and settings. And I gave some examples around the way I would practice at the bedside, but you could think about the way we set up, for example, this physical structure of a clinic or of a waiting room, all the ways in which one might change your organization if you're thinking through the lens of, oh, well, maybe there's a high probability that any one of my patients in here may have experienced trauma. And this goes links in with the next slide, which is a broader concept around trauma. And this is the concept of historical trauma. And when I speak about this, I remind people that this is not a concept that we learn specifically in our Indigenous communities. This is something that has been, there have been major genocide across the world and throughout time, but we really learned a lot about historical trauma through the scholars who wrote about the Holocaust and Holocaust survivors. So Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart is a Lakota scientist, and she actually wrote about this idea of historical trauma in an Indigenous context, as she applied it to collective suffering, memory, and trauma to the historical trauma experienced by her people, the Lakota people. And this was related to the course of colonial conquest and the attempts at assimilation. So historical trauma, this is where you see there's this delicate dance around not assuming that every person that, oh, just because you're an Indigenous person, you've experienced trauma, because that would not be culturally safe because you're making assumptions about a particular individual. But recognizing that one of the reasons many of our peoples may have issues around access and even crossing the threshold into a healthcare institution is because of either trauma that they've experienced or historical trauma that then becomes manifested from generation to generation, what we call intergenerational trauma, because of what institutions have done to our peoples in the past and actually in an ongoing way. And when I'm speaking about this example, I often talk to the fact that, for example, if you're going to give birth in a hospital as an Indigenous woman and your mother was a 60 scoop survivor and you recognize what experience she had being taken away from birth, it may be quite traumatic to then go into a hospital institution to give birth to your child and thinking about the experiences that your own mother had and the experiences of many of the women in our communities, let alone the fact that many of our women are still experiencing forced sterilization, which is an ongoing major traumatic experience for many women. And as many of you know, there's the class action lawsuit taking place right now. So I just wanted to honor the experiences of those women and of all of our women and around their reproductive health and childbearing and just take a moment to think about them. I think it's an example of historical trauma and colonial trauma that we really need to be mindful of in our practices as clinicians. I'm going to move on now. And I think it's fitting that I was honoring our women to have this beautiful image of a quay. Again, by Chief Lady Bird and Selena Mills, just a reminder of how many of our nations are matriarchal in the roles of women. But this is actually a quote from a famous Australian Aboriginal scholar named Chelsea Bond, who said that, how might we get to a position which recognizes that to teach about race is not racist, but rather that pretending race doesn't really structure health outcomes? And my understanding from reading this paper where she wrote this is that this emerged because they were trying to include teaching around race and racism in their medical school and medical education curriculum. And there was a ton of resistance around that. And that's why I really liked to have the initial slide that I borrowed from Dr. Marcia Anderson around uh, uncomfortable versus unsafe. Because really all of us who've been thinking about cultural safety education for years and, you know, now evolving to cultural humility as an important component of cultural safety. You cannot teach about 
cultural safety and humility without also teaching about anti-racist and anti-colonial practice. Because as I said, there are, I've given a couple of examples around the data around access for our people. And I think we need to recognize that experiences of racism continue to structure the health outcomes for our people. And until we're able to have open conversations and discuss that and actually explore, for example, when we're looking at the quality of care experience for First Nations, Inuit, or Métis patient who may have a negative experience, that we put on the lens of how has racism played a role in affecting the access to care that this person has had or the outcome that this person experienced in their health care. And one of the really important examples to mention and to think about and for you to refer to, of course, is the case of Brian Sinclair in Winnipeg. There's been a lot of writing and I want to acknowledge Barry LaValle, uh, the group in Manitoba, for all of their writing and work around anti-racist and anti-colonial practice and understanding how racism really did have an effect on the care of Brian Sinclair and ultimately contributed to his death. So what does that mean, teaching about anti-racist and anti-colonial practice? I would suggest this amazing book by Elizabeth McGibbon and Josephine Atoa, who are out in Halifax. And it's from 2009, and it's called The Anti-Racist Healthcare Practice. And it's very practical, which is one of the things I like about it, because I think sometimes when I teach around access and racism. I speak about critical race theory and I have slides about that. But really for the purpose of today, I wanted us to be focused on some of the practical applications. I encourage you to go and read the critical race theory scholarship. But really this book that that Drs. McGiven and Atoa did is wonderful because it is so practical. So as you're teaching about it and how do you practice this? So the key ideas around anti-racist practice is that we see the path We teach our learners and we as practitioners learn to see the path from stereotype to oppression. So how does the stereotyping, biasing that we have affect experience of our patients? So how does it oppress them? Understanding then and connecting those experiences of oppression to policy. So really focusing on what can we do to make change and then acting for change. So just a short bit on that framework of anti-racist and anti-colonial practice. And I'm going to move into the second component of the presentation here, which is to focus on some specific ideas and ways in which we can work at overcoming barriers that our people's experience in healthcare in order to create high quality care experiences for every single First Nations, Inuit, and Métis person. So just this reminder that all of the work that we might do around anti-racism training for individuals and, you know, cultural safety and cultural humility training and implicit bias training is important. But no matter how open and unbiased our practitioners may be, they still are working against the backdrop of structural violence, racism, and marginalization. And that we need to be thinking at the system level always when we're considering how to improve the experiences of our people. So the next section is really how, what are some of those system level changes or structural changes and process related changes? Because I find we talk a lot now about structures and systems and processes, but thinking about what one can actually do in a concrete way on the ground level can be difficult. And so this work is the work that I did with that amazing steering committee that included Indigenous community members and leaders in healthcare, as well as non-Indigenous leaders in healthcare. The goal was to think, okay, how can we actually make the change to create better healthcare institutions for our people? So that's the background and context. As I said, the steering committee included 18 or 19 Indigenous and non-Indigenous leaders. And what we did is we did a large environmental scan, did a couple of case studies, and then interviewed people across the country, both institutions and leaders and organizations and community members who felt that their institutions were doing a great job in this area and some who felt that there was still a lot of room to go. And the outcomes include these wise practices. So the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we use the term wise practices. Wise practices, I want to reference the work of Cynthia Wesley Esquimo and, and Brian Callio here, 
uh, they were speaking about wise practices in the context of Indigenous leadership. And it's a different approach to best practice. And in our healthcare environments, we're often talking about, okay, the best evidence is best practice, but a wise practice is different from that. Because we can't assume that what works in one situation, context, or culture will work in another, particularly if we're saying, well, this has worked in a biomedical, non-Indigenous institution, or this has worked for in a non-Indigenous institution for non-Indigenous peoples. It's not necessarily going to be a practice that works for our peoples in either an Indigenous or a non-Indigenous organization. The next slide gives another critique of the best practices approach, and that is that often the evaluation processes and tools reflect Western European values and knowledge, that it's a hierarchical construct that some would call non-Indigenous, and that it can create this reliance on large, well-funded, academically directed studies that may be harder to enact and follow through on a local level, particularly on a community level. So in distinction to that, there is this idea called wise practices. And next slide is one of the definitions cited in, in the work of Drs. Esquimo and Calio, and that is that wise practice by its very nature is idiosyncratic, contextual, textured, and probably inconsistent. It's not standardized, not off the shelf, and not a one-size-fits-all concept. My approach, I, you know, I'm trained as an internist. I'm trained in the model of large randomized control trials and evidence-based guidelines, et cetera. And I am not in any way suggesting that we throw that out. I think our people must have access to the very best care and the very best high quality evidence to drive our care. But we also need to recognize and value the knowledge that comes from our communities from traditional knowledge keepers, from community health workers and others who have seen what works in their own context and who can see on the ground level what's likely to work based on their knowledge of their own community. And so I see wise practice as a way of integrating that, quote, best evidence, best practice evidence, and adapting it in a textured, contextual, idiosyncratic way, as wise practice definition says, to the specific context of your organization. And I find it's a really fruitful way to think about moving forward so that we can integrate uh, the best of both worlds for the cares of our people. So the first week, we came up with these 10 wise practices based on our interviews and case studies and the literature review, and I'm going to share those with you now. So the first is at the policy and system change level, and that is for healthcare organizations, non-Indigenous, or to support their local First Nations, Inuit, and Métis leaders and their national organizations as they negotiate, develop, implement, and evaluate health transformation. And whenever I share this, people say, well, what about the local organizations? And of course, the local organizations are important, and that's going to come up in the slides that follow. But not going off and assuming that just because you're a world-class institution in you know a particular center that you know what's best for Indigenous health transformation, but in the spirit of self-determination that you're considering what our own leaders and community members are saying. Next slide is a focus on those local partnerships. So our healthcare institutions need to identify key stakeholders for community engagement. And here we come back to this idea of relationship. Our organizations need to build strong relationships with those local stakeholders. And by identifying key stakeholders, of course, implicit here is Indigenous organizations or stakeholders. So they may include a local and regional First Nations, the Inuit and Métis governments, Indigenous health service organizations, Indigenous clients, and others. Another important thing for the organization to do is to make a commitment to reconciliation and Indigenous health equity as a part of the strategic plan of the organization. And what we know from the literature around organizational change is that having equity in your organization's strat plan does lead to change. And the reason for that is that resources end up having to support that. Of course, one can have tokenistic things in a strategic plan, and that is always a danger. But overall, when an organization makes a commitment to equity and specifically Indigenous health equity, they are accountable to that. The CEO of the organization or others are in it. And it's important to make that explicit in your organization's strat plan. The next slide is about governance and leadership. So organizations need to promote the involvement of Indigenous peoples across the organization. 
And that means recruiting them for governance and leadership positions. This may mean uh, the board of directors or board of governors, an advisory circle, community liaison, elders councils. This will depend on your specific organization because, of course, remembering that these are wise practices. These are just some general ideas. And when you have these Indigenous peoples in your organization, that they're being really meaningful engagement with them and accountability. So reporting back to your organization, this is how we're doing. This is the number of people we're working with. These are their experiences. So that those kind of activities, the reporting back and action-based accountability help with tokenistic engagement. So really thinking about governance and leadership. And I like to use the example of because we're undertaking this kind of transformation at Women's College Hospital. And one of the things that we're very proud of and excited about is that we have the first Indigenous woman who's the chair of our board. And we have other Indigenous people who are on the board. And we have people in other leadership roles throughout the organization, as well as an elders decision-making council. So where are the Indigenous peoples represented in your organization? The next slide is about Indigenous staff and healthcare providers. So we talked about governance and leadership. This is now at the provider level. So again, one needs to recruit, retain, and mentor staff and healthcare providers at all levels. And I was reminded about procurement because I don't, as a provider, think about who our institution is purchasing things from. But it's nice to think about, okay, how can we as an organization support Indigenous companies and providers, not just within, but outside? Who are we sourcing our art from? Who are we sourcing our foods from? Who are we sourcing our linens from? Are there ways to support Indigenous orgs uh, that way? We need to create a working and learning environment where Indigenous people thrive. So it's not enough to hire Indigenous peoples into your organization. They need to be valued and feel that they are included. And we know meaningful inclusion is being able to be yourself within an organization. And so One can't just go out and hire people. One has to make sure that they are being supported and did well. And that goes on to the next slide, which is about anti-racist practice. So one of the recommended practices is that all members of the organization do some form of education. And that in order to ensure that Indigenous peoples and clients and others, not just Indigenous peoples, but other peoples working in the organization, are able to debrief experiences that are not good ones within the organization, whether it be a racist experience, another discriminatory experience. And this needs to be done in a safe way so that there can be support for their well-being, but also so that the organization can grow from these experiences. And we just went through this with a partnership there where there was not necessarily an ideal relationship. And actually, just recently, we had a debriefing with the leaders of both the healthcare institution and the Indigenous organization with whom we were partnered, and we're able to really learn from it and think about what processes we needed to do to make the experiences better next time. And so not only do you need to be able to have opportunities for everyone within an organization to speak about these experiences, but you need to keep track of them. And I say this is like the quality and patient safety movement in healthcare. When we first started talking about QI and patient safety, First of all, there was a period when nobody understood it. And then once we understood it and our organization started to commit to this and talking about critical incidents and near misses and errors, you saw a massive spike up where there were all of these incidents which were being reported. And now what you're seeing in many of the healthcare institutions is that these are starting to plateau or come down as we have these safe processes. And one should expect that the same would happen around complaints and human resources. You want to keep track of how your organization is doing. The next slide is about cultural safety education. And again, I love how Northern Health at UNBC and CCIH talk about cultural safety and also cultural humility. And I really think that's where we're at around the space of thinking about education in this area is both humility and safety. One needs to have humility in order to create safe spaces for our people. But we need to support Indigenous learners in our healthcare professions by creating respectful learning environments for them. And they need to be places that are free of racism. And our organizations need to commit to participating in supporting and mentoring students and learners. And of course, the caveat there is that 
if you're bringing high school students or others in to participate in programs, make sure that they're working with people who've done this education and ideally with Indigenous mentors, but if not with Indigenous mentors, then people who understand the experiences of Indigenous peoples in institutions and are going to be safe and good mentors for them. The next two slides are about Indigenous client care and outcomes. I'll just talk about the first one. To enhance access to specific programs, one needs to have the commitment at the institutional level to do that. I can't say specifically what the program will be for your clinic, your community center, et cetera. That will depend on your own engagement activities and what your clients are telling you they need. So that may be an Indigenous patient navigator, and we know many of our centers have that. Specifically, there's a good literature to support the presence of Indigenous patient navigators for our people as they move through the system, particularly in cancer care context. It may be that our patients want access to traditional foods. They may want to be able to see a traditional knowledge keeper or practitioner, spiritual support from elders, land-based healing. These are just a couple of the examples. So really making the effort to find out what your specific communities, Indigenous communities needs are of your organization and going through the work of doing that engagement and then, you know, making the changes within your organization to support that and finding out iteratively adapting it. It may be that you tried this food program or this had this space for smudging and healing and it may not have been right. So that's, you know, the humility piece is saying, okay, we're trying this and we're willing to grow and learn and adapt it. Our last slide around the wise practices for our organizations is really to think about tracking the health outcomes for our peoples within organizations. Many of our jurisdictions do have data related to race and ethnicity. The problem is often that data is not great. And there are a couple of Indigenous epidemiologists and researchers, someone like Janet Smiley, whose name I've mentioned a few times today, who would say, you know, that the usual way in which we collect data is problematic, but there are ways in which we can get really good, accurate data. So thinking about how you're going to keep track of, you know, who you're caring for and what are the experiences of your Indigenous clients and how do they compare to those of non. And, and that means what are, you know, outcomes. Looking, we can look at traditional, at the usual metrics for institutions like, you know, in the inpatient setting, what is the length of stay in hospital? What is the readmission rate? You know, how many eMERGE visits, et cetera. But also, what are the metrics that Indigenous communities value? So how do we track that and how do we include that in our data? Anytime we speak about data, we need to think about data stewardship agreements and following the OCAP principles of ownership, collaboration, access, and possession of data. And the last piece around wise practices is that we need to support and address Indigenous social determinants of health. And many of us as Indigenous scholars, I think, turn back to the work of Marlene Brandt Castellano, and, and she wrote this a long time ago. But it's a reminder that fundamental to the right of self-determination is the right of peoples to construct knowledge in accordance with self-determined definitions of what is real and what is valuable. And I think thinking about how our organizations can support self-determination, even if we're not an Indigenous organization, but all of these practices are really about being guided and being led by Indigenous peoples in order to determine what their needs are within the organization, whether it be around access to care, whether it be around what metrics are meaningful and important, whether it be around, you know, what sort of programming you're developing within your institution. So with that, I wanted to end and take questions and make wish to all of you for your attention.